Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. It was Eric Ten Hag's first competitive match when Manchester United hosted Brighton. In the end, it was Brighton who walked away as winners, thanks to a double by Pascal Gross, whilst McAllister scored an own goal. The XG shows that in terms of chance quality, things were roughly even. But what tactics did Ten Hag use in and out of possession, and how were Brighton able to get the win? In this video, we'll take a look. Here's how both sides lined up courtesy of the One Football app. Ten Hag opted for a 4-3-3 as we've often seen during pre-season. The 4-3-3 could shift to a 4-2-3-1 often, with Fernandez and Eriksen being very flexible. Brighton on the other hand had a flexible 3-3-3-1. To get lineups like this, stats, match updates and so much more, check out One Football for absolutely free through the link in the description below. We'll begin by looking at Ten Hag's tactics on the ball. On the ball, United's initial shape often looked like this, with Sancho and Rashford both looking to hold the width out wide, whilst Fred would be the sole pivot, allowing McTominay and Fernandes to drift much higher. McTominay tended to stick on this right-hand side, whilst Fernandes had a lot more fluidity in his positioning. Brighton could have fluidity with their shape, to always have Lolana covering Fred, and then Welbeck would be joined by another forward so that both centre-backs would be under pressure. Alternatively, they could maintain their 3-3-3-1 shape instead, with Welbeck being the sole presser higher up the pitch. But crucially, Fred as a sole pivot was always covered by Lalana. And with both shapes, the goal for Brighton was to clog the centre of the pitch to not allow United to have any joy in this region. So this was a shape we often saw from United, using a traditional back four, whilst Fred as a single pivot could become isolated, as both McTominay and Fernandes had pushed higher up whilst the Lallana was often looking to tie him up. So the Brighton shape was variable. It could be a 1-2 with Lallana always looking to make sure that Fred was picked out, whilst at the same time they could have a front who would both be able to put pressure on the remaining centre-backs. And when United began to advance with the ball, Lallana could be the difference maker as he could then push forward to join the front three, meaning that Brighton would now be pressing with a forward three was Lallana's cover shadow would mean that Fred still couldn't be found. One thing that Potter did that was interesting is that when United had the ball in open play, but in slightly deeper regions, they stuck to a dedicated back three, where most teams would be more inclined to shift to a back five. Ten Hag may have spotted the opportunity to utilize these wide regions, as Webster and Veltman were often dragged into wide one versus one situations like this, so being isolated in these situations would have presented an opportunity for United. And one thing to note is that although Brighton came away with the win, there were many situations where on a different day United could have had joy in these 1 vs 1 situations. So in these situations when Maguire was pressed, the space would often be with Shaw, as Trossard could easily cover Dallo, so Maguire when he managed to find Shaw with the switch, would have found a man in the space who could potentially advance up the pitch. And here again we can see that Brighton are initially in their 3-3-3-1. And, once again, Lalana is sure to pick up Fred. But as soon as Maguire begins advancing with the ball, Lalana is then willing to apply pressure. And crucially, he does so at such an angle that his cover shadow still ensures that Fred can't be found with the pass. One thing that Maguire did well is that with Brighton pressing around the ball, he identified that Luke Shaw would often be in the space out wide, so he would often get the switch into Shaw when possible. And an element which we'll touch on soon is how when Shaw had the ball, United would look to overload this left-hand side by getting a midfielder into the space. But in the build-up, Ten Hag could at times shift to a back three. Both fullbacks would be required at times to become the third centre-back, either with Dallo dropping deep or Shaw if the ball was on the other side. In these scenarios, Brighton would be able to enact a great press, as Trossard and March would be happy to push higher up whilst Lalana was still covering Fred. In certain situations, Trossard would remain deeper and the ball would be ushered to one of the centre-backs, at which point Lalana could look to press while still using his cover shadow to cover the ball into the pivot. So for teams with an elite pivot, it may still be possible to find the man as they could play a one-time pass into somebody who had space. Alternatively, an elite ball-playing goalkeeper could then function as the extra man, which would then have allowed United to play out. But as we know, this is not Fred or De Gea's strong suits, so under pressure they often struggled. And in fact, it led to a high quality opportunity for Brighton. United were vulnerable in the press, primarily due to De Gea not being great on the ball, and neither is Fred. 
So here, Brighton are pressing in man-to-man -man situations around the pitch, meaning that the only pass is back towards De Gea. Once here, there are two major problems once again. De Gea doesn't have the best decision making, so he opts to make a pass into Fred, who is already under pressure. At the same time, Fred is not the best on the ball, so when he does receive, he makes a risky choice by looking to play out to Dallo. However, the ball is then easily intercepted and Brighton are in an excellent position, although it doesn't come to much. In open play, United did struggle to get the ball to Fred most of the game. One way Ten Hag did look to get around this was by getting Maguire to drive into the midfield with the ball, to then subsequently draw a man, potentially allowing Fred to get on the ball behind the first line of pressure to then find a man higher up. But the way Ten Hag used McTominay was quite aggressive. McTominay, instead of dropping deep with Fred, was often in the right-hand half space. This could create space as it could draw two men towards him, freeing another man in the midfield. But Ten Hag also looked to use his athleticism. With the Brighton back three being spread so wide, there was plenty of space in between the centre-backs, so we would often see United look to work situations where this space could be grown even more. For example, if a man got on the ball out wide, and McTominay would then make the run, unmarked, often, into the half space and try and create an opportunity. So Brighton's back three tended to be spread fairly wide across the pitch. And we can see here that Valtman has come all the way out towards Rashford in the space, meaning that there is a bunch of space between the two centre-backs here, although nobody makes the run. But as we'll come on to, McTominay was the man who was often willing to make these runs behind the defence. Again, we can see how potentially wide the Brighton back three is. So when a man is drawn towards the United winger, it creates space in this region that's just waiting to be taken advantage of. And here's a perfect situation where that does happen. Again, Brighton have a wider back three with no wing backs, and this gap only gets bigger. But this time, McTominay is able to make a run between the centre backs. So then he is found in this position, and his cross to Fernandes eventually leads to a great chance that goes over the bar. But United also got into good positions down the left hand side. This was usually when Shaw was able to get on the ball, potentially drawing March higher up the pitch. Fernandez, as discussed, was very flexible in his positioning, so he would often get into this pocket down the left hand side, whilst the presence of Rashford was isolating Veltman, meaning that he couldn't come and press Fernandez. This means that from these pockets, Fernandez was able to look for a ball into the box or into a man in a more dangerous position. Or he could go for the simpler option to isolate Rashford against Veltman. And although he did run at his man, he didn't have any luck with this during this match. And here's where United were often able to have some success. Marsh is drawn onto Shaw, whilst at the same time Rashford remaining high and wide means that the centre-back is pinned in a deeper region. As a result, a man could drift in between them, in this case Fernandes, and look to receive the ball. And now he's in a little bit more space to look to make a pass. As the game went on, when United were in these dangerous positions higher up the pitch, Brighton could shift into a much safer shape. This was either through dropping one midfielder, or at times even two, deeper, so that now it was a back five or a back four, meaning that there was less gaps between the centre-backs. But still, despite the win, Brighton did look vulnerable at times. And as discussed, having Fred as the sole pivot was one of the problems that United faced, as he is not great on the ball. So, instead, Ten Hag then shifted Eriksen much deeper and took Fred off the pitch whilst also bringing Ronaldo on. With Brighton somewhat holding on to their lead, Eriksen now had more space to dictate, whilst Ronaldo also provided a reference point for the attack. And another thing to note is that United were very willing to overload the box, especially with McTominay running into the box as well as Fernandes, so often they could get into great crossing positions with the potential to find a ball into a man making the run. As the game went on, Brighton did switch to a dedicated back four in order to reduce the space that United could get in higher up the pitch. But let's quickly touch on what United did out of possession and how Brighton were able to be so effective. As we know, Ten Hag is a manager who likes his sides to press high, so in these situations, we would often see the front three ready to apply pressure onto the centre-backs, whilst McTominay and Fernandes could be drawn onto the deeper midfielders. Brighton are a possession heavy team, so usually they would let to play out short, but in this game, to get around the press, instead, they were willing to go along, often into the wide regions, and this is because with Sancho and Rashford high pressing, when the ball was played long, Brighton could get men around the ball to then win the second ball before advancing forward. 
And here we see that United could press in more of a traditional 4-2-3-1 shape against Brighton. Fernandes was often looking to cut out the deepest pivot, but we can see that the front three can still be man-to-man -man against the centre-backs. And here we do see that Sanchez, unlike De Gea, is more comfortable on the ball, so he can be the fourth man in this 3 vs 3 situation to give Brighton the advantage. So now Sanchez has time on the ball, but instead of playing a riskier pass into one of the covered men, with Rashford being so high up, it means that there is potential to isolate Shaw. So Sanchez opts to go long. And in these scenarios, Brighton would always look to get men around the ball. So, and in open play, Brighton did play with a single dedicated pivot, and at times, Fernandes was able to cover McAllister effectively, limiting the amount of touches he could get on the ball. But at the same time, at times, he was able to get away from his marker and then advance higher up the pitch. And one thing that the Brighton shape would provide them is plenty of options between the lines, as March and Trossard could tuck infield looking to receive a pass. At the same time, they could also remain wider, and Trossard in particular would pick the ball up in these regions as Dallow was not that aggressive on his man. This, paired with other men between the lines, could draw the attention of the centre-backs, freeing the potential for Welbeck to make the run in behind, and we saw this diagonal pass quite a few times during the match. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might enjoy the content available on my Patreon. Not only does Patreon help to support the continued production of content, as I am a one-man team, but it also gives you early access to videos that will come on the channel. You'll also get exclusive videos, get to vote on polls, and so much more. And it's cheaper than ever, no longer having a tier system, so everyone on the Patreon gets access to all the content. So head over to patreon.com slash simple to check it out. And a special thanks to my latest patrons, including Dimitros, Chrysophidis, Liam White, Gene Some Random Guy 7, Brian Liddell, and Kevin Gonzalez. But that's all for today, and remember, keep it simple.